Hello and welcome to MCN edition February the 5th 2003. Look at that bad boy. So just before I start kind of a continuation of um, the road test idle video that I posted I just want to say a massive thanks to everybody for watching it and um, and for all the kind comments really means a lot um so i wasn't going to do another video but um i think enough people are interested in uh, in a bit of nostalgia about um what was happening back in the early 2000s with bikes so <clears throat> just before i crack on i suppose if i continue my story just very briefly um I joined MCN in, in October with the, the road test idle and all the rest of it. And I did that first feature, Land's End to John O'Groh. So I rode that flat tracker bike. And then over the course of the next few months, I got to ride a load of other test bikes. I moved properly from Ramsgate to Peterborough. I lived in some uh, digs in Peterborough for a little while after my hotel stay and then uh, rocked up in Oundle for a little while and then ended up by the end of the year living in Stamford, which is where I live now. Um, but for those first probably 10 years, I used to go home almost every weekend. I used to get homesick. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and also, um, I'd done my first launch, which was a Kawasaki Z1000 launch. So that was the end of 2002, it's a 2003 model. And it was a launch where um, I didn't actually have to do anything because we'd ridden the bike in Japan or Mark Potter, the editor, had. Karazaki used to give us these special um, kind of invitations to ride bikes before the, the main launch. So Potsky did that and that left me to go and do the, the launch kind of with no pressure of having to write or anything. So, you know, that was a massive pinch me kind of moment getting on a plane flying to Italy, rocking up in Sorrento with all these other journalists that I'd been reading for years. I just remember being in reception and seeing everyone's crash helmets on the table in the morning before the ride. You know, there was Chad's, um, who else? Warren Pohl, Alan Dowds, I think Sonsky from Superbike was on it, Dave Coates. And I just remembered all the, the helmets, all the painted designs thinking, wow, this is pretty special. <laughs> Um, and then in January, three months after I joined, um, I'm on a plane on the way to Spain with a massive group of us about to do a 600cc group test. In um, We got uh, Cartagena to ourselves and then we rode on the roads from Cartagena to Almeria, which was amazing. I mean, back then, 600 group tests and 1,000cc group tests were huge. And as I'll show you in a minute, in MCN, there's 18 pages dedicated to the 600 group test. I mean, now 600 tests have disappeared. <clears throat> we still do 1,000cc group tests from time to time. They're much smaller animals than they used to be simply because people don't buy the bikes anymore. And to an extent, it's almost irrelevant testing a thousand. They're all so good. You know, when you're sitting there talking about tenths of a lap, how they're different from each other, it kind of seems a little bit irrelevant. But it's still uh, it's still useful to compare them because we get loads of uh, emails in asking which bikes people should buy. And that's the whole reason we do this job. Um, but yeah, these were, these were big animals back in the day. And we used to be able to spend a lot of money on, on doing it because these newspapers used to sell tons and they don't anymore because the world's a different place. I mean, even MCN itself was bigger. It's physically smaller now. So this was kind of a collaboration, this test between MCN and performance bikes. Um, and I remember being on the plane thinking, Fucking Jesus, you know, I felt like a bit of imposter syndrome, which I even do now. Um, and then, you know, I was talking about feeling a little bit out of my depth in the office because it's full of trained journalists and hardened hacks. 
Now I'm in a situation where I'm among loads of other road testers and suddenly I feel crikey, am I going to be able to ride as well as these guys? What am I going to say? <clears throat> I mean, again, I didn't have to do too much on this test. I was basically just a rider and gave some opinions. Um, nowadays, I kind of write the theme, theme tune, sing the theme tune, organise the tests, I write them, do videos on them. It's a, it's a different different life now. There's far fewer of us. Um, <clears throat> before we dive in, a few people have been quite interested about what's going on back then. So I'll just pick a few pages at random. I mean, there's the cover. I mean, an image like this, Bruce Dunn doing a crossed up wheelie on a CBR 600RR. That sold newspapers. That was exciting. We used to, we used to get the bikes before anyone else. Mainly, there used to be a big race between all the the publications and who could get the bikes first and who could get the test out first. And normally, we would uh, go um, go to the manufacturers, get the bikes, get the test turned around really quick, so they're out in the paper. And yeah, it was really important then. So if I pick a couple of the. Uh, yeah in so the news pages we got a story about um the foggy patronus road bikes picture of foggy there with bleach blonde hair and it's saying that the first 77 have been built and homologated so now the wsb bike is clear to race and there's a picture of all the bikes lined up i mean that story is still kind of shrouded in mystery a little bit isn't it whether they made enough bikes to homologate them for racing I mean, I'm pretty sure they started racing them before they sold the road bikes. Yeah, they were beautiful though. Sounded amazing, but didn't really do that well, did they? Um, <clears throat> scan through. This is called cool. the, the bike shop ads. This is Riossi. And just looking up the bikes that are available at the beginning of 2003, you know, you've got GSX-R thousands for 529, oh no, yeah, Jesus, 5295 for a GSX-R1000, brand new in 2003, Jesus, R1-5595, RSV-6995, ZX-6, ZX or ZX-636-5195, <clears throat> incredible, how lucky were we? I mean, what's the what's the super bike now? They're all late teens, early twenty thousand pound now. It's a different world. But also, like I was saying, with the sports bikes being on the cover, people have got a lot more choice now. You know, if you wanted a good bike back in the day, the a sports bike was the one that held, had all the technology, um, and anything else was a little bit of an also round. If you wanted a tourer or an adventure bike or whatever, they didn't quite have the the might of the factories behind them like they did with the sports bikes but nowadays if you want a bike there's so much more choice fantastic bikes i mean i've literally just ridden a motor guzzi mandelo and that's fantastic for the technology for the character it's, it's it's comfortable it's fast you've got all those sports adventure bikes like multistrada v4s and that kind of thing retros i mean the, the choice now is amazing but <clears throat> you've got to pay for it Right, let's go through, let's skip the 18 pages of loveliness, that is the 600s test, skip to the sport, we all like sport don't we, so we've got a story about 2003 was kind of um, the first full year of MotoGP where all the bikes were four strokes, I think 2002 some of them were two strokes and some were four strokes, but there's a story here about Team Roberts and they're saying that um, how MotoGP bikes will be five seconds a lap faster in the future. Not quite true. And they said it will, they'll have active suspension. And that never happened. They said they might have ABS. That's never happened. And they said it'll have 250 horsepower. Well, that's definitely happened. I mean, road bikes are close to that now. The new Panigale V4R, something like um, 240 horsepower with the race kit and the the special oil that goes in it. Get that screen going again. 
there's also another story in there in case I forget about um, in, back in the news about a £50,000 road going Rossi copy due <clears throat> so there's rumours there of Honda making a MotoGP bike in 2003 and that eventually came to fruition in 2015 with the RC213 VS got to ride that at Valencia and a few other times which was really amazing in natural fact along the way I remember speaking to Dave Hancock and they actually tested Honda tested the V5 MotoGP engine in an RC45 chassis because they were going to build one um, but they ended up not doing it because to make a V5 engine um, affordable to produce they had to dumb it down so much the engine ended up being quite heavy and not very powerful so they never they never went for it which is a shame um, there's a Hodgson V Walker story that was a kind of they were the superstars of the day, weren't they? I mean, this one's all about 2003. So that would have been when Hodson started the factory Ducati, the Fila Ducati, Fila 999. And then Walker was on the GSE bike. So there was a talk about their, their battle there. And then the other thing that's quite different to what it is now is that we used to dedicate one, two, one, two, four spreads <clears throat> to off-road. So one of the reasons there was Adam Duckworth, our editor, is really into his uh, off-road bikes and still is. Um, really good rider and photographer. Um, and yeah, we used to cover we used to cover all the bikes, all the main news stories. We used to test them, but that just doesn't happen now. There's just not the demand for it anymore. I mean, talking of which, when I first got MCN, I'm sure a lot of you remember the club racing results were in there. And when I first started racing. If you got a top six you get your name in the paper and I always used to look forward to seeing my name in MCN if I ever did well in racing um, <clears throat> so let's quickly talk about this uh, this 600s test so the the opening page is the I remember this these bikes are laid out on the road from the uh, from our Maria circuit down towards the um, the kind of the, the wild west place that they've got down there red hot middle of january and we've got all these bikes to ourselves we've got fuel tires i think we left the standard tires on in more recent times with group tests we changed the tires because tires on new bikes are so different if you if you've got a performance test the tires will skew the results so if you put the same tires on all the bikes then at least that takes that uh, disparity away but I think on this one we we had all the tires standard and um, and there we go so we got the the CBR 600 that was new for that year so that would have taken over from the CBR 600 FS as a sort of sporty CBR 600 and that was an unashamed um, MotoGP replica I mean that looked like a mini RCV looked absolutely fantastic and it was such amazing quality I mean that's got to be one of the best quality bikes I've kind of ever encountered in my time. It was just amazing. Beautifully built, like a little jewel. We had a Ducati 749S in there. Um, an R6, GSX-R 600K3, and the new ZX-6R with the upside down forks. Um, so yeah, so the idea of this test is that we tested it on the, on the road and the track. And then we've got an order, so we've dedicated a whole spread to each bike. That, that's unheard of now. We used to go to the trouble of taking all the bodywork off so you could get technical shots or side-on shots. Um, and it was kind of stat crazy. We used to data log them, dyno them, lap time them, everything. So the GSX-R finished runner-up spot. I mean, it's interesting to see how we'd rate these by today's standards i mean the gsxr is an amazing track bike i think we probably marked it down because probably the quality isn't as good as the, some of the other bikes on the test probably isn't quite as good a road bike but looking back through time is i think it's stood the test of time well performance wise i mean 600s haven't really moved on I mean, they were making just over 100 horsepower at the back wheel on BSD's dyno in Peterborough. 
and they probably never made a lot more than that before they started to fizzle out over the last few years. Um, <clears throat> and if you got on a GSX-R600 today, it would still feel amazing. So this was kind of the first generation K bikes, K1 to 3 were the same, weren't they? And then their first kind of update, major update was 2004. And Suzuki used to update them every two years, used to go to launches, massive technical updates that they just don't do anymore. So the GSX-R was in fifth. Then, then there was the, in fourth, Ducati 749S. I think this was my first ever kind of track picture working for MCN. I was just, you know, I was just amazing. I still feel chuffed now that I can still remember that feeling, seeing your picture in the paper. And it was the first time I'd worn my custom Arai crash helmet that Rich Hart sprayed up for me. Um, and I had a smiley on one side and the Union Jack on the other one. And in rec more recent years, or a few years after that, it kind of changed slightly. So it was a half and half smiley and Union Jack. And they did that because they made a replica of my crash helmet in 2005. And um, to avoid paying royalties to whoever's got the smiley, they kind of broke up the, the logo. Um, so that was really cool. And that was a nice bike. I mean, it's still a bit of a Marmite bike, isn't it, in terms of looks. A lot of people say that this and the 999 almost brought Ducati to its knees and then the kind of 1098 rescued it again. Um, but that was probably, I mean, it wouldn't have been as dynamic as the other 600s. It's a bit kind of, a bit lazier, a bit slower steering. Um, but it was really good. I mean, that would be lovely today, wouldn't it? Right, then we've got the R6. So I would say that the top three are really, really close. So the R6, even by today's standards, that's probably still, it's probably no different to the newer one, really, apart from a, the newer one's a little bit sharper, tiny bit more power. So this would have been really amazing on the track. Um, proper little pocket rocket. Quite a good road bike, but it probably would have been marked down a little bit because it's it's not as great a road bike as some of the others, and it had some kind of older tech. I mean, this was the this was the time where radial brakes started to come in, upside down forks. So if bikes didn't have them, you'd get a little bit. Mm, that's not that's not very uh, advanced. <laughs> now look at bikes. The second place was the the ZX6. I mean, that's a, even by today's standards, that's still brilliant, isn't it? That was a proper little, that was probably the sort of raciest Kawasaki that had come out, small capacity anyway, since the, the KO1S, I reckon. You know, that, that reminded me of the KO1S when we tested it, just in its spirit, you know. It's a bike that you could ride out the showroom and go absolutely bonkers on. And that had upside down forks, that had radial brakes, it's just, there's just so dual like. If you think of middleweight super sport bikes now, like the R7 and the RSV and that kind of stuff, I mean, they're nice, but they're parallel twins. They sound a bit lawnmowery. And they're just not special, like these bikes were with like beautiful aluminium frames. And, you know, they've got aluminium frames now, but they're kind of cast alley built. Sort of mass, they've got a real mass produced feel about them. And then the CBR600, I mean, First time I clapped eyes on this, I fell in love with it. When I rode it, I fell in love with it. Trevor Franklin wrote the test and I was desperate, desperately hoping it would win the test and it did. But it was a no brainer. It was lovely around the track. It's a beautiful, beautiful bike to own. Um, it's lovely to ride on the road. If you were to find a bog standard, good condition, one of these originals, oh, that'd be brilliant. And I actually had one as a long-termer, a two. I crashed the first long term twice in the same week, doing a tyre test at Croft, lost the front, and then a track day at Donington later that week and lost the front through coppice. I've got a lot of stories about that bike, but that's the one for another day. But yeah, so then, so the next spread is turn by turn data for every single corner around Cartagena. That would have been with Bruce riding. 
We had Bob Gray, who worked for PB at the time, doing all the data logging. And he's gone on now to be like a top data logging guy for a lot of uh, race teams in BSB and beyond. He's proper clever. The next spread is all performance analysis, top speeds, standing quarters. Um, what we've got here, top speeds are all about sort of late 150s, early 160s back then. They're all so close. Acceleration, top gear roll-ons, braking from 70 to zero. No ABS then, the bikes were a lot lighter. Braking performance of bikes like that are better than today because they're not carrying big cats and they're not, they haven't got lean sensitive ABS that kind of freaks out when you brake hard. All the power figures, all the torque figures. We had Stefan Bartlett, that was my boss. Um, he gave an opinion on all the bikes from kind of a, a non-racy point of view. So he came with us as well. And then these are just some of the people on the test. We have Trevor Franklin, we have Bruce Dunn, we have me, we have Bill Spurdens, who was uh, our MCM designer. So on big tests like this, we used to have designers come out with us as well as photographers. It was Howard Boylan, a fantastic photographer, who uh, was an MCN staffer for a lot of my time through MCN. He now works on golf, fantastic golfer as well. Um, so it was just a genius. This this was this was the transition from digital from um, film to digital. So this is the day where a photographer takes a picture, and then that's it. Nowadays, photographers who've grown up with digital, when you're doing passes through corners, they you miss a lot of shots because they're sitting there looking at the back of their phone, uh, their <laughs> camera. But it's just different times, isn't it? But Howard was absolutely bang on. He's brilliant. And then we, we must have had 10 people with us doing this test, whereas now it's like one or two. The times have definitely changed. Um, so yeah, so that was the 600 test. We would have done a 600 test every year, really, I suppose, until, wow, well, when, when did we start losing interest? I suppose 2012, 13, 14, the bikes stopped coming out, didn't they? Um, and yeah, it's a shame with those 600s. They've, they've got a bit of a reputation of being sort of cramped and peaky, but they're not that bad. You know, when you ride one, you're always pleasantly surprised. You think, oh, actually, this has got a, a fair bit of power. Um, but the average age of motorcyclists is kind of, with most people are too old to want to, or too old or in too much pain to want to scrunch up on a, on a sports bike and go fast. And I completely agree because I've changed my outlook in life I, I wouldn't really want a 600 on the road anymore I'd rather have something a bit more comfortable and then have a have a separate track bike so yeah these really were of the time but it's a real shame that there's no was well, not a lot of younger riders coming into our world our sport our passion you know if if younger riders got on these they'd, they'd be as excited as we were back in the day which is a shame so that was MCN in February, that was kind of a little bit further into my journey. Um, yeah, maybe next time I'll talk about something people ask me about a lot is about um, riding racing bikes. You know, over the years we've had fantastic access to race teams and we've ridden some really cool race bikes. And I've even got to ride Ross's Yamaha M1 which was probably the pinnacle of my road testing career in 2006. It's all been downhill from then. So maybe I'll do a little video about riding Ross's bike. Um, but yeah, so thanks very much for washing. Washing, thanks very much for watching. Um, please don't like or subscribe or hit the bell. Let's just keep this between us.